Greetings. This is to be a lecture on relativism with regard to science. So we're looking at relativism and absolutism, two different notions about uh, the nature of truth, et cetera. And um, I have a separate uh, lecture on relativism in ethics and whether ethical knowledge is relative or whether ethical knowledge is absolute. Um, but this is a related notion. And so, uh, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not ethics per se, it's actually science. Right? So hopefully this will be more clear when I actually start doing the lecture. So let me share my screen. So this is actually a lecture of, I've, I've adapted from um, another lecture that I give when I'm teaching philosophy of science, either in my intro class or as an upper division course. Uh, but it's a dispute about the nature of scientific um, Thank you. Uh, it's a dispute about the nature of scientific claims and whether they are absolutely true or only relatively true. And again, similar to the uh, issue that we looked at in ethics as well, okay? So it's called Structure of Scientific Revolutions because it's taken from a work by a philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn. Uh, that was the title of his work. Now, Kuhn, uh, was reacting to an earlier philosopher, Karl Popper. And Karl Popper was a, a very um, important philosopher of science in the early 20th century. And he had set some very high standards for scientific rigor and what constitutes confirmation of a scientific theory, et cetera. And he won, wanted scientists uh, consistently to set out to disprove their work. You might see, well, that's a little odd. Well, any scientific theory, according to Popper, was always in the state of uh, process of being uh, disproved, that hasn't been disproved yet. And what does he mean by that? Well, actually, what he's pointing out is that you can't actually verify a scientific theory. And what do you mean? Well, imagine I'm setting up an experiment and I'm saying, look, if my theory T is true, then I should have observational result O. I have observational result O, right? I run the experiment and there's O, just what I my theory predicted. Therefore, my theory is true. But what Popper points out is that that's a fallacy, right? Uh, that's what's called affirming the consequent. And we've talked about that a little bit briefly earlier in this class. If T, then O, O, well, nothing follows from that conjunction of those two claims. So this cannot be how science proceeds or should be understood to proceed, according to Popper. It's not proceeding by a matter of confirming uh, theories. Again, this is the fallacy of um, affirming the consequent and nothing strictly follows from the combination of if T then O, O. He thinks Scientific testing really must take the form of if T then O, not O, therefore not T. So what he's saying is, is look, if my theory is true, I should have observational result O. I don't have observational result O. Well, then my theory must not be true. So he thinks the real engine of science is not verification, but falsification. And so the way science proceeds and should proceed is with uh, scientists continually trying to falsify a theory. Now, if a theory resists falsification time and time again, it starts to grow in credence. Uh, we, we start to accept it more broadly. Nevertheless, it's not confirmed. And again, the process can't be confirmation, according to Popper. It can only be attempts at disconfirmation or falsification. There is something to be said for this approach, uh, looking for data to contradict your beliefs rather than more data that supports them. Instead, Popper is using the potential conflict between a theory's predictions and actual data about the real world to drive science forward. So this is what he thinks the model of science uh, should be, is, etc. Popper argues that science is accountable to rigorous objective standards, in particular falsification, which he regarded as the core of science. 
This is how science progresses, according to Popper. But uh, further, this is what demarcates genuine science from pseudoscience. So for instance, Popper was actually a critic of Marxism because he thought that Marxism started off by making bold, uh, falsifiable claims. It was making real claims that were falsifiable and therefore it was a kind of science, uh, a scientific theory, which was making predictions about how the world would uh, develop. But then the world didn't develop in the way that at least the initial set of Marxists thought it would. Um, and so rather than say, oh, our theory has been falsified, let's come up with a new theory. What happened is that Marxism, according to Popper, revision, um, revised itself and developed uh, what's sometimes referred to as rescue hypothesis. And it turned itself into something which was unfalsifiable. Now, if a theory is unfalsifiable, according to Popper, that's a sure sign that it's not a scientific theory. It really even brings into question whether it's saying anything useful or meaningful at all. But what demarcates genuine science from pseudoscience, according to Popper, is whether the theory is falsifiable. Right? Um, this is why Popper would regard metaphysics as not a science. Why? Because it's unfalsifiable, at least in his view it would be. Um, you might take a similar view of Freudian psychology as being unfalsifiable and therefore not a real science. Whatever you think about this, this was a very influential view in the nature of science in the early 20th century. Now, later philosophers were somewhat critical of Popper's view. This, they claim, is idealized science at best. It is not how actual science is practiced. For instance, when he looked, the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, couldn't find much evidence of this falsification actually happening in practice. So he says, well, if you actually look at the history of science, how it's been practiced, how it is practiced, you find there's a whole lot of other features, historical, political, social features, cultural features that go into the practice of science. And this clean uh, falsification view as, uh, as promoted by Popper would at best be an idealization. And in fact, uh, Kuhn seems to hint that it's not really even possible. And we'll see why in a moment. So Thomas Kuhn developed a theory of science and scientific progress, which directly challenges that of Karl Popper. He argues that most of the time science, what he calls normal science, operates within a set of given assumptions or paradigms that are taken as given and not subject to testing. If true, this would greatly restrict the extent to which Popperian disproof does or even could arise. So the paradigm, among other things, sets up what the questions are, what an adequate action to the question uh, would look like, what an uh, adequate answer to the question would look like, and what explanatory resources you can draw upon in order to form the answers to the questions. So all of this is actually constructed by the paradigm. Now, whether the paradigm is accurate or not is not a question you can ask from within the paradigm. Right? because the paradigm is setting up the discourse. And so it's very difficult to get outside the discourse in order to analyze the discourse itself. In fact, the paradigm as conceived by Kuhn becomes a sort of fundamentalist orthodoxy about how the world is. Normal science is merely the process of elaborating the paradigm or central theory in greater detail. A whole generation of scientists grows up with this set of common assumptions, and according to Kuhn, uh, as a matter of historical fact, they exhibit strong resistance to any data that might call the central paradigm into question. So again, what he's saying is when you actually look at the practice of science, we find these paradigms, and when, we, and when data arises that seem to be inconsistent with the paradigm, Right? potentially falsifying the paradigm. It's not that scientists say, ah, we've, we've disproven our theory. We've disproven what we believe the, question, the right way of asking the question is, or we've disproven what we think the right explanatory resources are, et cetera. No, we find that's a great resistance to that. Um, kind of a, a social built-in conservatism, uh, holding on to the existing paradigm. 
And think about it this way. Often scientists' entire career has been invested in saying these are the questions and these are the right ways of investigating it and these are what likely are the right answers, right? Um, their grants, their, their tenure at uh, uh, universities, uh, their position as heads of um, departments and et cetera. We mustn't overlook the fact that these social features play into how science actually is conducted. And this is what Kuhn is pointing out. Originally, he printed this in an article in International Encyclopedia of Unified Science. Here, Kuhn argues that science does not um, progress via this linear accumulation of new knowledge, but undergoes periodic revolutions, which he calls paradigm shifts. He reviews past major scientific advances and attempts to show how the steady accretion of scientific progress via normal falsification, how that view of scientific progress is wrong, or at least uh, seriously incomplete. Science advanced and advances the most by revolutionary lurches forward. Each revolution introduces seismic reconceptions of the way the world is. So large, they must be called paradigm shifts. Kuhn is responsible for popularizing the term paradigm, paradigm shift, and paradigm change. So again, if you're wondering, you know, what, what sort of thing does he have in mind here, without going into all kinds of detail, one of the biggest paradigm shifts in modern uh, times, again, modern moving back to the 1600s, would be the Copernican revolution about the nature of the, uh, of the heavens, the celestial bodies, etc. For the longest time, we thought that it was... Um, the earth was the center of the universe and all the celestial bodies revolve around it, including the sun. And that was the reigning paradigm for a very long time. And all the observations that we made of the night sky were interpreted in such a way that they would be consistent with that paradigm. But that became more and more difficult to sustain over the centuries, millennia actually until eventually it just became unsustainable. And it's not that we just fixed the theory a little bit, we ended up abandoning that paradigm and adopting a completely new paradigm. And so we went from the Ptolemaic or geocentric view of the heavens to the heliocentric or Copernican view of the heavens where the sun is the center and the planets, et cetera, all revolve around that. So that's the nature of a paradigm shift. But notice how long it took for that paradigm shift to take place, right? Even when the, the geocentric theory became increasingly unstable and, um, and, and inconsistent with the data. Anyway, uh, Thomas Kuhn defines paradigms as universally recognized scientific achievements that for a time provide model problems and solutions for a community of researchers. So again, it's the general way the community of researchers understand what problems need to be addressed, what answers would uh, look like satisfying answers, what explanatory resource to draw upon to come up with these answers. Um, in short, the paradigm is a comprehensive model of understanding that provides members of the field of science a perspective on what the problems of the field are, how to go about solving them, and what a proper solution would look like. Paradigms gain their status because they are more successful than their competitors in solving a few problems than uh, that a group of practitioners has come to recognize as acute. Uh, Kuhn challenges the traditional understanding of how science progresses then. He argues that the history of science, as I said, is punctuated by moments of revolutionary breakthroughs, what he calls these paradigm shifts. During these times, the entire scientific discipline is transformed. Kuhn outlines six stages with respect to scientific progress. The first stage is what is called pre-science. And here there is a general lack of any central paradigm. Given that um, uh, any discipline, this stage only occurs once. Subsequently, there's always an existing paradigm. So be in the stage of pre-science, 
uh, where they have begun to focus on a problem area, but they're not yet capable of solving that problem or making any major advances because we haven't really organized what the problem is. We haven't articulated that very clearly. Right? The field cannot make major progress on the central problems at that point because it doesn't know and therefore cannot articulate just what the major problems are. Likewise, it cannot tell what the answer to the problem would look like. Similarly, you wouldn't know what explanatory resources to draw upon in order to try to solve that problem. In this period, one starts from ground zero and attempts to build science from scratch. Because there is no paradigm to organize the data, all facts seem equally relevant. Science consists simply of collecting data with no organizing principle. So let's say I knew that people were dying um, and, and they were dying younger than uh, of old age or right, than normal, right? So they're dying and, 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 and it seems like an acute problem. Would I start by looking at their horoscopes? Would I start by looking at their astrological signs? Would I consider whether or not their first names start with B, right? Well, you might say, no, none of those things would be relevant. Ah, that's because you've already got an idea as what might and what might not account for people dying prematurely. In other words, we've already started with an idea of what a good answer would look like and what it wouldn't, what facts are relevant and what facts are irrelevant, right? Now, again, if I'm just saying, well, they're dying prematurely, it's still, I don't know what facts are relevant yet, but because pre-existing paradigms, we might say, yeah, but you know, what, what the first letter of their name is, uh, is it wouldn't be a relevant fact to gather. But now we move to the next step, which is the beginning of normal science. During this phase, scientists operate within an overarching paradigm that guides them in their research, the formation of questions and conducting experiments and data gathering. So once we have a paradigm, once we have a general idea of what it is we're looking for, what facts might be relevant and what facts are probably not relevant, um, how to gather the data, what experiments would help us uh, focus and sharpen our understanding, that's when we can start to do genuine science, what he calls normal science. The paradigm provides the researchers with the means to ask questions and test answers to those questions. This is the puzzle solving phase. Guiding, guided by the paradigm, normal science is extremely productive. When the paradigm is successful, the profession will have solved problems that its members could scarcely have imagined or would never have undertaken without commitment to the paradigm. So keep in mind, what Kuhn is saying is these paradigms are very useful. They help us organize our, uh, our thoughts. They help us gather appropriate data. And we do make progress in understanding what it is we're trying to understand and solving problems we're trying to solve. In this stage, scientific progress consists of extending our knowledge of the facts. Again, facts as delineated by the paradigm working on those issues highlighted as important by the paradigm, increasing the match between the observations uh, and the paradigm's predictions, and further development and articulation of the paradigm. Science, uh, scientists doing normal science do not work to refute or overthrow the paradigm, or even to find out whether it's true, according to Kuhn. They presuppose that it's true and work on that assumption. So that's key. <laughs> Given the work that paradigms do in structuring research, um, there has to be the assumption that it's true. But that means that Popper's idea that we should seek to disprove it is exactly wrong. In fact, you can't use the paradigm to disprove the paradigm. But if or since the paradigm forms the operating assumptions needed to do science, ipso facto, it cannot be falsified. This puts Kuhn in direct opposition to Popper and the claim that falsification is the engine of scientific progress. But now we're into the third stage of science, what is called model drift. During the period of normal science, the failure of a result to conform to the paradigm is not seen as refuting the paradigm, but rather is interpreted as a mistake 
on the researcher. Oh, well, you didn't clean the beakers properly, or you misread the gauge, or you set up the experiment wrong, right? um, uh, or, uh, or you're simply mistaken about what you thought you saw. So a few anomalies, cases in which the obser uh, observational facts do not match up with our paradigm, uh, with rather, let's try that again. A few anomalies, cases in which the observational facts do not match up with what our paradigm has led us to expect can always be explained away. Again, the experiment was badly performed, et cetera, right? But then these um, anomalies begin to accumulate and they can accumulate to an extent that we move into the fourth stage that Kuhn outlines, which is called model crisis. Kuhn claims that anomalous results accumulate and the paradigm comes to a crisis stage. As anomalies accumulate, there grows a suspicion that there might be something fundamentally wrong. Hmm, why is, why is it so difficult to, uh, to reconcile our observational uh, data of the celestial spheres with the Earth-centered view of the solar system? Why is that so difficult? Right? Again, Kuhn argues that uh, this in seeming opposition to Karl Popper's notion that science corrects itself pro uh, and progresses via the falsifiability criteria. So I'm just repeating myself there, okay? Then we move to stage five, model revolution. At this point, a new paradigm is formulated. Hmm, maybe the sun is the center and all the celestial bodies revolve around it. The new paradigm, if it's to be successful, must subsume the old set of accumulated observations, both the anomalous results and the non-anomalous results into one coherent framework. Even so, there is and will be resistance within the scientific community to adopt the new paradigm. There is an inherent conservative impulse in science, according to Hume, and the old guard scientists will seek to preserve their previous worldview. So, of course, um, uh, the, the Copernican model of the universe was resisted by uh, people both in and out of the scientific community. Now, Galileo got himself into a lot of trouble when he published his uh, discourse uh, on two world systems, I think it was the name of his book, and where he suggested that the Ptolemaic model was wrong and the heliocentric model was right. Now, something that uh, I, the point being made here, when Copernicus initially proposed his sun-centered model, um, he proposed it with circular orbits that all the planets uh, and celestial bodies in, uh, in were going around the sun in circular orbits. But if you use circular orbits on a sun-centered system, it actually did not work as well as the system he was trying to replace. Kepler introduces the notion that maybe the orbits aren't circular, maybe the orbits are ellipses. Now, why did Copernicus think that the orbits were circular? Well, because Aristotle had said the orbits were circular and that was the paradigm and people were resisting moving it. It took, it was with great reluctance, even Kepler was reluctant to suggest ellipses, but he does near the end. And when you plug in elliptical orbits into a sun-centered, now we have a system that works much better. And so it subsumes uh, the old results under the Ptolemaic model and the anomalous results that seem to be inconsistent with the Ptolemaic model. So, but even so, Right, it was another couple generations of scientists until you had um, a uh, rejection of the Ptolemaic model and the full acceptance of the heliocentric model. So that would be the paradigm shift. At this point, the new paradigm is accepted and the old one is discarded. This is termed revolutionary science, or again, paradigm shift. Hume suggests that this may take a generation. He literally thought that it might be that the old generation of scientists has to die off uh, before the new paradigm can really be uh, take hold and become the reigning paradigm or retire, right? Maybe they retire from their positions. And, uh, um, 
The change from one paradigm to another is not dictated by observational data in any straightforward way. For a time, both paradigms will have ways of accommodating the data, what uh, has been referred to as rescue hypothesis, right? So if you um, are familiar with how the Ptolemaic system worked, where the earth is a center, it was realized pretty early on that it wasn't um, perfect concentric circles, right? And so in order to accommodate the, um, the anomalous data that was being accumulated, uh, they suggested the idea that, well, maybe they're circles on circles. So if you're curious, look up the term epicycle, right? And so the notion of an epicycle was introduced to preserve the paradigm and preserve the notion of circular planetary orbits. But even that became problematic. And so they developed another rescue hypothesis of the different. So it's fascinating stuff, actually. But that's not our purpose today. But if you're curious, that's where you would want to look that up. Uh, proponents of the different paradigms may have different interpretations of the criteria for theory choice so that theory A looks simpler and more coherent uh, with existing theory to proponents of theory A, while theory B looks simpler to proponents uh, of theory B. So remember, since the paradigm contains within it uh, a set of what it takes to be good theory-making criteria, well, when you judge paradigm A by the criteria inherent in paradigm A, it, it is better than paradigm B. But of course, if you judge paradigm B by the criteria inherent in uh, criteria B, it looks superior to paradigm A. So within uh, their own set of criteria, each looks superior to the other. Moreover, to some extent, exponents of different paradigms have difficulty even communicating with each other because they will use the same terms, same phonemes, but with quite different meanings. So it's not really clear that what Newton meant by gravity is what uh, Einstein means by gravity. And so, yeah, they're using the same word in a sense, right? Uh, it sounds the same, but it doesn't operate the same within their, their systems. And therefore, it, it may not really be the same concept at all. All right, so this is <laughs> the cycles of science. Only once does pre-science happen, and then pre-science moves into normal science. That's where the paradigm has been adopted. Then we have model drift, where there's these little few anomalies uh, that are explained away. Then they tend to expand and accumulate, so we get to model crisis. Then we get to model revolution, where a new paradigm is proposed but it's not accepted at first. In fact, it's quite uh, vociferously resisted. But then we get eventually a paradigm change or paradigm shift. But then we're back into normal science and then model drift and then crisis, you get the idea, right? Hume's account of scientific progress has Darwinian or evolutionary overtones. Right. Uh, remember, evolution, it said, is sometimes um, punctuated by or uh, punctuated equilibrium is a term from Darwinian theory. It's a theory that evolutionary biology, which proposes that most species will exhibit little net evolutionary change for most of their geological history, remaining in extended state of stasis. So what we might call normal science, right? It would just it persists uh, relatively unchanged. When significant evolutionary change occurs, this theory proposes that it's generally restricted to a rare and geologically rapid events um, of branching speci speciation. I, know, I said that wrong, but you get the idea, right? So that's what punctuated equilibrium means, right? Uh, it's commonly contrasted against the uh, idea of gradualism in evolution, which states that evolution uh, generally occurs uniformly and by a steady or gradual transformation of whole lineages, right? Well, this, this is a controversy within evolutionary biology, but Kuhn's account of scientific progress uh, seems to be more uh, uh, um, uh, uh, reminiscent of the punctuated equilibrium model. It is not possible to understand one paradigm through the conceptual framework and terminology of the rival paradigm. 
So there's a sense in which the researchers of two different paradigms may not even be able to talk to each other. That's what's meant by incommensurable. You can't actually speak to each other. David Stove and other critics of Kuhn claim that this account of science suggests that theory choice is fundamentally irrational and relative. Well, that's where we're going with this, right? If rival theories cannot be directly compared in some objective, non-paradigm dependent way, then one cannot make a rational choice as to which one is better. So remember, I understood relativism as the view that there are no ob uh, absolute principles by which to adjudicate between competing theories or worldviews, whether that's ethical theories or ethical worldviews, or here, scientific theories and scientific worldviews. So there's a sense in which Kuhn is um, suggesting that there is no neutral, objective, absolute grounds to decide between competing theories, scientific theories in this case. Now, Kuhn himself denied this view, uh, he, and he denied his, that his view had this result, and he sought to clarify his views to avoid further misinterpretation. Um, he was even quoted once as having said, I'm not a Kuhnian. <laughs> which is odd because he's Kuhn. <laughs> Nevertheless, Kuhn does stress the incommensurability in a number of different but related areas, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the point I'm making here is Kuhn, the philosopher of science, Kuhn, the human being, kept saying, I'm not a relativist when it comes to science. And that's not what my view claims, except it kind of is what his view claims, right? So he keeps saying all these things, which does seem to lead to a relativistic view of science, um, despite the fact that he says, that's not what I'm advocating. So for one, he thought that there is no neutral language. This means that the most, uh, this is the most basic sense in which Kuhn uses the notion of incommensurability, no neutral language. The idea is that different paradigms, even if they use the same vocabulary, will use it in different ways so that scientists committed to differing paradigms will tend to talk through each other, but not to each other. Second, there's no neutral observations. From a Cunian perspective, all scientific observation is theory laden. So your paradigm um, affects what you think you're seeing. Right? What we observe depends to some extent on our pre-existing theoretical commitments. Our theories provide the categories in terms of which we classify our observations and thus to some extent affect how and what we see. Right? So we describe the world in the terms and the uh, using the explanatory resources as set up by the paradigm. So there's no neutral observations then. Third, there's no neutral criteria for theory choice. In The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, this was his book, um, uh, chapter nine, Kuhn appears to suggest that each paradigm carries with it a set of evaluative criteria, good making qualities, right, on which it scores well, so that there can be no extra theoretical neutral criteria that will decide which among competing theories is best. So again, that's pretty darn clearly or it comes awfully close to saying there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing scientific theories. In learning a paradigm, the scientist acquires theory, methods, and standards together, usually in an inextricable mixture. Each paradigm will be shown to satisfy more or less the criteria that it dictates for itself and to fall short of those dictated by its opponent. So again, the paradigm will score itself high if you're using the paradigm to analyze the paradigm, and it will score its computers, uh, competitors low. Third, I mean, sorry, fourth, there seems to be no neutral world. Now, this perhaps is the most radical of the uh, claims Kuhn makes. He's suggesting that scientists committed to different paradigms, in a certain sense, live in different worlds. Now, he doesn't deny that there is a real mind independent world, which is not affected by changes in our theories or paradigms, but nevertheless, he insists 
a la Kant, I'll get back to that in a moment, that the world we experience and live in is reshaped and therefore changed when our theories change. So um, we, we don't need to worry about Kant right here, right now, but if you're familiar with Kant, that might be helpful to you, which Kant basically claimed that the world I live in is the world that my mind fashions for me, right? The world I experience is the world as interpreted and filtered and shaped by human cognition. Right? Um, and so there's a sense in which my mind is shaping the world that I exist in, right? Now, Kant, thought all human beings shape the world in pretty much the same way. And so we all live in pretty much the same world or we have very similar worlds of experience because our human cognition is universal. This is what he thought, right? And so, you know, my, my computer is shaping my Word document for me, but then I give you my flash drive and you call up the document on your computer. Well, darn it, it's the same darn document. Why? Because your Word program is shaping your Word document for you in exactly the same way that my Word program is shaping my Word document for me. Right? So since we're shaping the world using the same program, our documents are going to be identical. Right? He insisted on that. What, he, uh, what Kuhn is suggesting and post-Kantians suggested is maybe we don't all put the world together the same way. Maybe I'm running Word and you're running Google Docs or Pages, right? And so you might be putting the world together in a very different way, right? Likewise, what Kuhn is suggesting is our paradigms shape how we experience the world. And so there's a sense in which there is no neutral world. Our world is always going to be dependent on the paradigms we bring to it uh, and that uh, give our experience the shape that they do. The enormous impact of Kuhn's work is evidence in the change it, uh, it has affected, I should say, in the vocabulary of the philosophy of science. So words like paradigm shift, paradigm, normal science, scientific revolutions, these are all very commonly used now when, uh, when philosophers of science talk about scientific theory, etc. Hume seems to have shared with Kant the idea that the really real independently existing world for Kant, the things in themselves, is completely unknowable and that the empirical world, which is knowable, is partly constructed by our categories and concepts. Some suggest that this is um, inconsistent to claim both that there is a thing in itself and that we cannot know anything about it. Eh, that's, I threw that in there for brownie points, don't worry about that, but there does seem to be a certain inconsistency there. Just as the philosophers who followed Kant tended either to be realists who argued that we can know the real nature of things or idealists who rejected the idea that there is a thing in itself, so post-Kuhnian philosophers of science tend to either be straightforward realists who think that science gives us real knowledge of the world, or anti-realists uh, such that uh, what science gives us, or, uh, uh, such as, for instance, social constructivists, who seem to reject the uh, cogency of a mind-independent world at all. And they basically are saying that what we really are doing is um, coming up with models to manipulate our experience of the world. And that's the business that science is in. And the effectiveness of the model depends on the problems we're trying to solve. Personal footnote that I came across when I was on the web. So this is, so that's the main presentation on the uh, relativism within science, okay? But um, I came across this uh, on the web when I was researching Thomas Kuhn and someone had posted this to a, uh, a blog post. And he was saying that sometime in the mid 70s, I was browsing the philosophy of science section in Dylan's, uh, the London University's bookstore. And I pulled out Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution for a look. A professorial type appeared alongside me and glanced at what I was reading and said, scientific revolutions, my ass, and walked off. It was Karl Popper. <laughs> Just, that's a funny story, okay. Anyway, hopefully you have found this uh, hopeful, uh, useful rather. 
Uh, and of course you have my notes on it. If there's anything you'd like to talk with me further about, please, by all means, reach out to me. And until next time, thank you for your attention.